This week sees the 100-year anniversary of the first Labour government. So my Mark Meats guest is the author of a brand new book all about a century of Labour in Britain and that very first post-war Labour administration. David Torrance is the author of The Wild Men, the remarkable story of Britain's first Labour government. I'm so excited about this conversation because isn't it cyclical, right? Very cyclical that you had a Labour government exactly 100 years ago this week and we're about to have another one. Something I want to look at is how the Labour movement has changed. So, David, welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. Your book is a great historic tome. The year is 1923. The First World War ended four years previously. All men finally have the vote and it delivered a surprise result. Yes, but actually a very complicated result. And it's, it's a bit difficult to get our heads around this from today's perspective. We think of parties winning elections and then forming a government. What happened then is that Stanley Baldwin, the Conservative leader, called an election expecting to increase his majority. He wanted to change his economic policy. In fact, he lost seats, Labour gained some, and the Liberal Party also recovered uh, some of its losses the previous year. So you had a, a very rough three-way split in the House of Commons, mm. but such was constitutional convention, such were uh, political events, and the, the enmity between the Conservatives and Liberals at that point. The result was a, a Labour minority government. Well, indeed. Now, of course, Labour had to transition from being a workers' movement to a political party. How did the establishment react to the arrival of this first Labour government? Uh, some of them were extremely un unhappy about it. You have to remember that at this point, it's just a few years after the, the Russian Revolution in 1917, uh, an incredibly violent revolution. Uh, and some conservatives, uh, a lot of uh, media newspapers, they genuinely thought uh, that a, a Labour government in the UK would go down the same path, that to some degree they were even being controlled by Moscow. They were taking their orders from communists there. Others, others I think, realised that wasn't true, but sought to make political capital from playing on voters' fears that that might happen. And what's fascinating about the story is that these were very accomplished men, but not experienced in the world of parliamentary politics or the machinery of government. As the book title suggests, they were the wild men. Tell me more. So only a few uh, Labour MPs had any experience of government uh, from a, a coalition during the First World War. Ramsay MacDonald, the, the leader of the, the Labour Party and of the opposition from 1922, had no experience whatsoever. Uh, quite unusual then, probably, probably less so now, I, I think, given recent history. Um, so there was a real fear in some quarters that if they weren't wild and extreme, they would simply be unfit to govern. They, they wouldn't know how to run the UK, its mm. then vast empire. They would fail through inexperience. But actually, that didn't turn out to be the case. Uh, Ramsay MacDonald despaired on one level of, of what he had to work with. He didn't think his own backbenchers uh, were very high quality. Uh, so he assembles a cabinet of Labour people, left and right, uh, moderates uh, and more radicals, ex-liberals and even a couple of conservatives. The, the first Lord of the Admiralty, uh, Lord Chelmsford, protests to everyone on joining the cabinet that he's been a conservative all his life. And of course, it was a tumultuous administration that ultimately fell. But I guess the legacy is that it was the first Labour government and the first of many. Yeah. Uh, Ramsay MacDonald's whole strategy at the time was to demonstrate that they could be a party of government and indeed, after the October 1924 election, uh, which Labour lost, but they paradoxically gained a million votes, at that point, they displaced the Liberal Party uh, as the main alternative centre-left progressive party. And so in that sense, uh, Ramsay MacDonald's strategic aim of making Labour, proving that Labour were fit to govern, uh, passed at that point. He forms another government, another minority in 1929, uh, but from that point, he's prime minister until 1935. Uh, listen, only a few seconds to go. I would urge my viewers and listeners to grab a copy of the book because I started reading it and it's very entertaining and it's, it's fabulous history. Um, but just bringing us up to 2024, Patrick Diamond 
writing in the Labour-supporting newspaper Labour List, poses the question today, a hundred years since Labour first came to power, we must ask why it so often loses. Why do you think Labour haven't been more successful in reaching high office uh, than they have been? <laughs> uh, I can't comment on more recent events, uh, mm. but I think in the 20s and 30s, and of course it's 1945 before Labour form a majority government, I think there was, they still had something to prove. There was mm. still a fear from some sections of the electorate that, that they, they wouldn't be responsible in government. There were often splits at that point uh, in, the, in the broader uh, mm. Labour movement. Indeed, the left of the party was deeply unhappy with the, the first two uh, governments. And all of that, I think, contributed to it taking a bit longer than perhaps it should have for Clement well, look, it's, it, is a, it is a cracking read, as I say. It's beautifully written. Let's have a look. Uh, give me that uh, screenshot of the book, if you can. It's out now. It's by David Torrance. It's winning rave reviews. It's called The Wild Men, The Remarkable Story of Britain's First Labour Government. Thank you, David.